Thanks so much. I want to, uh, uh, <coughs> first of all, apologize, but I'm going to ask your uh, indulgence. I, um, I've got a little bit of a congestion and a little cough, um, but a little tickle in the throat and a little cold uh, is nothing uh, in comparison to uh, uh, what our friends uh, in Cuba have had to endure for um, 60 plus years. Uh, so it's my great honor um, to be here. Thank you for this opportunity. Thanks for coming and um, just sitting and listening to the various uh, organizations that have sponsored this event um, is very telling. Um, I think that, that there are, as Naomi was speaking, we were speaking as we were eating about the linkages between these various events and, and Cuba, um, that there is indeed um, uh, a lot that we have, a lot more that we have in common when it comes to the, the various struggles that we're all engaged in. Uh, and I'm impressed and, and admire the, uh, the tenacity of the work and the, the commitment of the, the folk in this room. Just a sprinkling of um, organizations that uh, I have been uh, the pleasure of hearing about your work um, is, is inspiring to me. But I, I sat and I thought, just about everyone who spoke, there was a you know a, an arc, a link back in many ways for me to uh, what um, Cuba uh, uh, represents. Can you all hear? Yeah. Okay. Um, the uh, well, I'll just mention one. The the uh, I think Naomi, when you were speaking about the young man, I'm sorry I don't know his name. The young man who was shot. That was Warren Williams. Yeah. Um, and the reference to uh, the fact that he was attacked, he was shot um, by the police, yet he's being charged with, with the crime. And it reminded me of the Cuban Five. Um, how many of you know the story of the, the Cuban Five? Most people? Uh, real short. The description, um, these were uh, five uh, gentlemen from Cuba who had come to the United States and essentially um, uh, infiltrated organizations that had been uh, perpetrating crimes against the Cuban people, all kinds of terrorist crimes that were being perpetrated against um, regular everyday Cubans in their country. And the idea was for them to get information about what these organizations were doing and then um, to turn that information over to the authorities, which they did. Uh, and when they uh, informed the, the U.S. government, the U.S. government turned the tables and uh, arrested them. Um, and it was a long, hard battle that many of us were engaged in to win the release of these five um, gentlemen, and I'm happy to say that they're, they're at home uh, in Cuba uh, today. But, that was just one of the, the links that I felt you know, connected to as we were sitting here talking about um, Cuba and, and why Cuba. Um, the fact that Cuba has uh, endured more than many nations, uh, certainly the longest blockade. Some refer to it as an embargo, but it's really important to just take a moment and explain the, the distinction between blockade and embargo. Um, an embargo is a unilateral you know, thing. I got a problem with you and we're, we've got a beef and we're working it out. But if I'm putting pressure on everybody else in this room to also beat up on you, then that's, that's a blockade, right? You, you're, you're being blocked from every uh, direction. Um, and the Cubans take that real seriously. That's their, their, um, they're very clear that this is indeed a, a blockade. For 60 years, they've um, had to endure that, but um, prior to that, um, as was mentioned, um, was the uh, horrific, uh, uh, tyrannical um, dictatorship of uh, Fulgencio Batista. Um, prior to that were, were others, and was uh, certainly the colonialism of, of Spain. Cuba has endured a lot in its, its history, more than 60 years. But 60 years since the what we've referred to as the triumph of the revolution um, is, uh, is why we're, we're here um, today um, to really uh, mark that very special occasion. Um, and I was asked to try to you know, highlight some of the accomplishments 
that Cuba has been able to uh, achieve in these, these 60 years, despite all of the, um, uh, the I mean, sometimes it's hard to come up with the, the right adjective. I keep thinking of a big old boot, right? A big old heavy boot on the, on the neck of a, of, a, of a country, and we're just trying to really uh, uh, strangle it um, out of existence. Um, despite all of that, you know, Cuba has really been able to do the tremendous things. Um, prior to the revolution, there were certainly the vast majority of Cubans who were suffering from regular curable diseases, the lack of education, health care, and adequate housing uh, and opportunities. And you know, the, the Cuban Revolution changed all of that. Uh, but despite those historical hardships imposed on the Cuban people, including this long-standing um, blockade, the Cuban people have managed to make incredible uh, accomplishments um, of, on a variety of different fronts. Um, and these were not just accomplishments for the island nation itself, but for the international community. And I think that that's a really, that's also very much um, connected to the links that are made between the various, uh, the various struggles that we were just talking about um, this evening. Um, because there really is, um, uh, as has been mentioned, uh, an incredible example that Cuba represents. And that that's what makes Cuba important, significant, and the reason why we feel we have to continue to, to defend her and defend her right to uh, sovereignty. Thank you. So, you know, I'm sure. I know. Okay. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, when I get off the bus at the um, New Jersey Transit, they say uh, I kind of have to crawl down the side. I've got really short legs, so. Uh, but at least I'm not. I'm not high. Um, but the, uh, you know, the bold example that Cuba. Um, under the, the uh, leadership of Fidel Castro uh, and inspired by the vision of Jose Marti, the, um, really the visionary behind the, the Cuban uh, revolution, has offered the world something that certainly can't be forgotten and especially not at this historic moment. 60 years of, you know, of pushing back uh, against uh, the oppression that, uh, that Cuba has been forced to deal with. 60 years ago, Cuba celebrated their victory over one of the most brutal tyrannies in this hemisphere. And for these past 60 years, Cuba has built their revolution step by step, uh, despite unending pressure from uh, the US government. How many people have actually been to Cuba? Okay. Most of you have. So you all, you know, you've seen some of what I'm, I'm, I'm describing. I mean, the, the tenacity of a country that has really uh, had to endure um, uh, you know, years and years of, um, of pushback. Um, there were efforts under uh, the previous administration, the Obama administration, to begin opening relations. Um, and while it wasn't as far as maybe some of us would have liked, for the first time, the, the US, a sitting US president visited Cuba. Um, for the first time, there was at least talk of you know, uh, the ability for there to be some kind of dialogue between um, the two nations. And it was inspiring and encouraging. And then, 45. So, here we are. But, more than ever, the reason that we need to continue to travel to Cuba, talk about Cuba, um, you know, uh, the, visit the, 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 the country and really help to uh, change that, uh, the misinformation, the misinformation campaign that's so prevalent um, about Cuba is greater than ever. And I'm convinced that, you know, this too shall pass. This, yeah. this, this administration isn't going to be there forever and we're going to continue to do what it is that we do. Um, to not only uh, encourage people to think differently about Cuba, but to think differently about the, the example that Cuba provides so that we can um, begin working toward those revolutionary steps that we've been talking about here tonight. Cuba is that kind of an example. 
and that's why um, it's important that we have events like this. Um, you know, those of us, I think, in this room, the majority of us in this room and our friends and neighbors from across the globe who are committed to justice, um, we're Cuba's true northern neighbors. And we're eternally grateful for the tremendous accomplishments that the island nation has achieved in those various areas of health and education, environment, and so many uh, other places. Um, it's a cruel irony that Cuba, a tiny country that has given so much to the world in the name of health care, is denied access to medicines and medical equipment manufactured in the United States. Even if only a small screw, a small piece, is, um, is uh, manufactured in the U.S., um, Cuba's barred from purchasing that equipment directly from the U.S., certainly, or from other countries. And, you know, many of us who have friends in Cuba have heard the horror stories of people who have needed and, uh, medical care um, and who it, it went unfulfilled because of that blockade. Some of you, uh, I think his name might have been mentioned, or maybe it was when we were talking, Reverend Raul Suarez, does it? Yeah. You know Reverend Suarez, right? What a lovely man, right? Amazing. And I don't know if you knew his wife, Clarita, who, who died tragically because medicine that she needed that was manufactured in the U.S. didn't make it to Cuba in time. Uh -huh. And it was heartbreaking. That's the personal, right? Because we, we know him and we know his family. But there's so many stories like that. Children who've not been able to get, you know, the, the uh, medicines for cancer treatments or um, uh, to, to prevent them from the, the wretched vomiting that happens when they're, you know, they're, they're taking that treatment. Um, case after case of, of um, folk who have been um, left hurting because of this mean-spirited, um, illegal and moral blockade. Um, but this is not just an immoral policy creating hardship for Cuba. It's also an example of the extraterritorial nature of the U.S. blockade that does not respect the sovereign rights of other countries to trade with Cuba, which is a violation of international law. So, piece of equipment that's you know could be sold by a German company, but it's got that one screw that was you know um, uh, manufactured in the U.S. Um, this blockade policy puts pressure on that country to prevent it from uh, being able to sell that to, to Cuba. That's insidious. It's insane. And who would blame Cuba if um, she refused to reach uh, out and give a helping hand to those in the U.S.? But that's the beauty of Cuba. That's not the case. Um, if you compare U.S. policy toward Cuba, to the island's selfless offer to share its medical resources in the form of doctors or medicines with the United States. Um, it's, it, that's a telling story. We know that Cuba has successfully manufactured medical uh, treatments that the world can benefit from, including those in need here in the United States. And many of you know this, this, some of these, these drugs and treatments. Perhaps the most well-known is the Cuban innovation um, vaccine, um, Simavax invented uh, by researchers at the Center of Molecular Immunology in Havana, Simavax targets a growth factor in cancer cells in a way that can arrest the spread of the disease. It can be used as both uh, a treatment for lung cancer patients and a preventative measure for people at high risk of the disease. There was an older gentleman who, um, who called IFCO. Um, this was about two years ago suffering lung cancer, and he knew that Cuba had this treatment. He knew that he was going to be breaking the law to travel to Cuba to try to get um, this treatment, and he wanted to, he wanted our help, um, and so we provided that help. He was able to go down, he was able, he was really far gone, he was able, they were able to extend his life for a period of time. He did pass away, but before he passed away, one of the things that he shared was, I was able to um, enjoy, you know, a little, life a little, a little longer. And uh, he enjoyed his, his time in Cuba. Uh, but it was tragic, it was sad. It was again another one of those very sad stories of uh, a person who, whose life could have been extended had this 
crazy, insane U.S. blockade policy not been, been in place. Um, there's a reported 5,000 patients worldwide who have been treated with Cinevax, and it has no known side effects. But the thing is, get this, this is what, I don't know. It costs the, the Cuban government one dollar to manufacture a shot of this you know, injection of, of Cinevax, one dollar. So that's a whole other story about the pharmaceutical companies here and the way that we prioritize. Who was that guy? Wasn't there a guy who had, was charging some yes. outrageous amount of money? Yes. 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 He's in jail. Martin Screlly. Yes. 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 Everybody, I couldn't think of his name, but I thought, this guy, he's charging, I mean, And in Cuba, they would have produced this, this medicine, um, a, a shot of it. They cost the government one thousand people. Yeah, it's 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 criminal. But more people in the U.S. die from lung cancer than from any other type of cancer, which is why many people are eager, eager to see this this drug um, uh, hit the U.S. market. Cimavax. Another treatment that Cuba has manufactured that some of you may have heard of since 2006 is a drug for foot ulcers called Hermaprot P. How many people know of somebody who's got diabetes? Okay. I, I'm, come on, I know, right? You can probably... <laughs> um, not only diabetes, but then, you know, people who have traumatic, you know, tragically had to have uh, amputations because of uh, their diabetes. Um, the reality is that herpa uh, prevents the need for amputations. It was invented by scientists again in Cuba at the Center for Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology in Havana. And the treatment is described as an um, uh, epidermal growth factor. It's basically injected near the affected area and can uh, accelerate the skin's healing process, closing the wound safely over the course of about three months. And I remember going to the, the center and seeing there was a presentation where they were showing, they kind of, what was that, fast track, you know, the, um, sped up the film so that you could see the, the healing of this, this wound, and it was phenomenal. But what a, what a you know, a wonderful um, gift uh, for those who were suffering from diabetes and could really um, uh, have this life-changing medicine. Just imagine how Herbert Pratt P could change their life. Um, but this is, again, it's, this is not just a political de debate. This is potentially life-saving uh, issues that we're talking about. There are about 73,000 U.S. adults with diabetes uh, that had lower limbs amputated in 2010, according to the American Diabetes Association. 73,000. Multiple studies of different uh, populations of people who have had their lower limb amputated showed that the procedure is linked to an increased risk of early death, suggesting either that surgery is a trauma that many people don't survive, or that people who submit to this kind of amputation are some of the most vulnerable and at-risk patients in care. So, you know, Cuba, yes, Cuba has, you know, certainly been restrained by the U.S. blockade, you know, prohibited from exchanging goods with Cuba, with the United States, rather. Um, one of the largest um, economies, the largest medical markets. But on the flip side, Cuba is a global leader in public health, and people in the U.S. are losing out on cutting-edge treatments coming out of Cuba. So despite its limited resources, Cuba has continued to export its doctors to various places in the world where need has arisen and taken it to a step further by providing medical training free of charge. Uh, so that those countries can provide care for their own people. So uh, Mabel was describing earlier the um, ELAM, which is the Spanish acronym for the Latin America School of Medicine. Um, what a tremendous, tremendous gift ELAM is to the world. And not to just the United States, but there are, are I think, 126 different nations that have sent their young people to study at the Latin America School of Medicine free of charge, uh, with the understanding being that these young people will come back and serve in communities back home. And that's a gift that is immeasurable. In e immeasurable. 
Thank you. Immeasurable. Um, the first time I heard about a Cuban doctor was in, in Nicaragua, actually. I didn't know anything about Cuban doctors. And, um, and it was amazing just to, to, to see the way that they were, they were not like the doctors I was accustomed to. You know, here, doctors are doctors. They're supposed to be you know, at a certain level. Um, and uh, these Cuban doctors were just regular everyday folk who were really committed to um, caring for uh, their patients. Um, but Elam, this training center for people who want to be able to care for uh, those in need, not only in their own communities, but to be able to travel to, as, as was being said earlier by Mabel, to other countries to uh, help when crisis hits. And we've seen that time and time again. We know about Cuba's effort to try to come when Hurricane Katrina hit and how Cuba was turned away. But that's what Cuba has done in countless places across the globe. Um, we know about um, the work in Haiti. We know about um, uh, after uh, Chernobyl. Uh, we know about the Ebola craze crisis. Um, you know, there have been example after example of, of Cuba's uh, efforts to try to uh, be there when a crisis has hit. Um, so, Elon, though, getting back to Elon, um, for the past two decades, Cuba has trained thousands of doctors from these various nations um, under full scholarship, including young people from across the U.S. And as Mabel mentioned, there are 175 graduates, trained doctors, um, that are practicing medicine in underserved communities across the country. Um, there are 75 currently enrolled. Um, this project is a true labor of love. It costs money to operate and thankfully we get little checks and support for people but I'll put a plug in that anybody who wants to help the students or help this program please feel free to talk to me about ways that you can you can uh, provide that support um, mentorships um, support for them to be able to take their exams etc uh, but it's a really wonderful wonderful program and ITCO is really honored to be able to um, be the entity that helps facilitate the um, finding the, the candidates for the scholarship program. And we're in the midst of doing that right now. Um, people are submitting their applications and uh, we're preparing for, uh, to receive um, the scholarship recipients for the fall of 2019. Um, but once again, looking at what Cuba has had to endure, much of it is a result of the U.S. blockade policy. It's incredible that this tiny island nation has made this generous offer to countries across the globe, including the U.S., to train doctors with that understanding that they'll return and, and provide uh, care uh, back at home. Um, but this is not surprising, given Cuba's history. Cuba's never wavered in her support of those who have struggled for self-determination across the globe. Fighting alongside African, um, African freedom fighters, Cuban soldiers struggled feverishly to crush the racist South African army in the fight against apartheid. And indeed, you, we've all, many of us have heard the, the saying that when Africa called, Cuba answered. But not just then, but throughout these 60 years, most recently being the, the, uh, the fight against the, the brave commitment of Cuban doctors to fight the deadly Ebola crisis in Western Africa, primarily in Guinea and um, Liberia and Sierra Leone. But Cuba's international reach stretched much further than Africa. And we can never forget that revolutionary Cuba's focus on exporting doctors, and in some cases, engineers, uh, to offer critical life uh, life-saving, lifeline, um, whenever a disaster has struck. Um, as we were mentioning earlier, from the devastating Hurricane Mitch in Nicaragua and Honduras, to the catastrophic earthquake in Haiti, from the uh, horrific Chernobyl nuclear disaster in present-day Ukraine, to the deadly tsunami in Indonesia, Cuba was there. Um, Cuba was there in Mexico and Puerto Rico and Brazil, and the list goes on and on and on. But this is, this is, this is Cuba. Uh, Cuba has served as that example uh, in multiple fields, including farming and sustainable development. 
His, um, she has already become a leader in the area of sustainable farming and limited use of fossil fuels based technology, such as tractors and uh, toxic uh, fertilizer. Uh, then there was also the, there's also the sociology of farming and how it can be a satisfying way of life for people in a post-industrial society. For organic farmers, it's as important as um, vermiculture, right? the taking of, uh, using of worms to process land waste and turn it into high-level fertilizer. But it's, it's just, you know, uh, one of the many ways that, that Cuba has really risen to, um, uh, to be that, that example. Um, in the environmental field, the same can be said. There's a number of international treaties that Cuba has uh, signed, and biodiversity and climate change, the Kyoto Protocol, desertification, um, the law of the sea, marine dumping. Um, many of these are, are, are um, treaties that not even the United States has, has signed. Uh, and unlike the US, in the human rights field, Cuba has signed several treaties, including the Convention Against Torture and Cruel and Inhumane and Degrading Treatment, etc., etc. It's a list. I could read the list. But what I wanted to point to um, is the International Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. Have you got that? The Convention on the Protection of the Rights of All Migrant Workers and Members of Their Families. And of course, the Convention on the Right of the Child. If we juxtaposition or juxtapose that support that Cuba offers to migrants and children with the Trump administration's treatment of migrant children, it's quite telling to me. Following the deaths of these two migrant children just recently, over the holidays, the Trump administration released more than 16,000 migrants onto the streets in El Paso, Texas. Just over the Christmas holiday, overwhelming aid agencies that had scrambled to find shelter for families left to fend for themselves. Advocacy groups in the border city said that the mass release was unprecedented as volunteers turned out in droves to bring food, water, and medicine to stranded migrants. Cuba's approach, unlike the US approach, is the example of what it means to be a true leader in the international stage. Again, these are just, you know, Cuba being Cuba, but the example that it provides is, um, is, uh, is astounding. Um, Cuba is celebrating its 60th anniversary of the triumph of the revolution, just as their um, country nears the completion of a unique and unparalleled process of participatory democracy. How many of you heard about Cuba's um, uh, rewriting of its Constitution. But that kind of blows my mind. I can't even, you know, that's not something you know you would ever, I've ever heard of being considered here in the in the United States. But nearly nine million Cubans from every sector of the island, and more than seven hundred thousand Cubans living abroad, have formulated proposals for a new uh, new Cuban constitution. And this elaborate process. It's been very involved and is involved, you know, getting receiving um, proposals from various uh, segments of society. Um, a draft being presented by a commission of deputies and experts. Um, and um, I don't want to put you to, to sleep on this, but it's it's, it's kind of, it's just I think it's really impressive. But this commission, in consultation with constitutional experts and relevant academics from different disciplines, have reviewed those proposals. Uh, that have come from 130 different base groups or assemblies. Um, and the point, the plan is that the approved document will be submitted to a vote, a, a constitutional referendum on February 24th, um, which is an important date in Cuban history because it's the day uh, in 1895 that Jose Marti organized the resumption of Cuba's War of Independence uh, from Spanish colonialism. Um, so it's, it's, it's on this 60th anniversary of the Cuban Revolution that it's clear that Cuba is building upon a rich historical foundation. And from day one of its revolution, Cuba has been bold enough to make changes aimed at benefiting the majority. They made those changes there. Um, but um, even um, still, 
I want to just say, Cuba's not perfect. Cuba's done, done a lot. Cuba's not perfect. And our Cuban friends would be the first to acknowledge that. Over the past 60 years, Cuba has been, I, what I say, tweaking. They've been tweaking their system in an effort to improve their revolution. If something hasn't worked or it's outlived its usefulness, Cuba will make adjustments or corrections. And just look at what they're doing with the, the Constitution. Again, something that would never been seriously considered in, in the US. Um, but even Cuba's willingness to make those adjustments, those corrections, is a further illustration of the tremendous example that Cuba represents. So on this historic occasion, it is only appropriate to remember Cuba's heroes and sheroes and to honor the people, because there's a lot of women, okay? All right? Um, I know we always see Fidel and Che and got Diaz Canal, but there were a lot of women, a lot of sisters. Can I get a sister clap? All right. Thank you. They have done tremendous, have made tremendous, tremendous gains in Cuba. Um, it's important that we, we honor the people of Cuba and their brave commitment to the world and that all people who hunger uh, for justice, uh, we owe it a, a, a debt of gratitude to Cuba's bold example and should be recommitting ourselves to continue to stand with Cuba in the fight against the U.S. government's brutal blockade. Que viva Cuba Revolucionaria. Que viva. Gracias.